Are we going? Green ladders. Yep. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I'm Olivia. Danny. And we run Thai Talks, which is a casual seminar series for marine science studies going on here at Duke University. Um, we kind of created it because I feel like it's very hard to learn about things that are maybe not in your, your disciplinary or you just want to like have a taste of different research going on. It's maybe not the research that goes on in your lab or you don't work in a lab because you study psych or something. I don't know. Um, so <laughs> Uh, we kind of created this so that everyone had an opportunity to um, learn a little bit, learn a little bit about new research. Also, so this is the second year that we've done this. Uh, Olivia and I are getting pretty old, so this might be one of the last ones we'll, we'll do. Uh, so thanks to some really faces, but feel free to get in contact with Relapse Scholars if people want to continue this uh, once we are out of here. Uh, also, we meet every single week to put these things together. With Aaron, so just put the hands up for Aaron. Oh, kind of, we would not happen in the hall, we're not um, But so, very excited. And today, we actually have our first economics based time talk, which is pretty exciting. For the last, first, <laughs> first of many more. So, uh, we've got quite an amazing speaker for us today. We've got Dr. Marty Smith, who is the George M. Woodwall Distinguished Professor of environmental economics at Duke's Nicholas School of Environment. He works in ocean economics, looking at seafood markets, fisheries, coastal adaptations, as well as marine ecosystems. He has had quite the illustrious career already uh, for such a young guy. Uh, he's had some amazing works in nature, science, PNAS, which is preceding some um, national academies, as well as some large and uh, Economics journals as well, and many other prestigious. So that was just a short little snippet of his amazing CV that we're going through, and then we also have someone in his class actually yes. who helped recruit him to Tide Talks, and hopefully we can get some other economic people. Yes. Well. So I am in Marty's class. I take um, economics of the environment, Viro one fifty five. Yes, yes, and I could not recommend the class course. Anyone has to take it. Um, I literally knew not a singular thing. I could not draw a blind marker like going into this class. Um, and as someone that wants to go into like, environmental management, I think that this is really important to know the economic side of it because the science part is super important. But we don't live in a science driven yeah. world purely. We live in a yeah. science driven yeah. world. Yeah. 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 Take it away. Thanks all for coming out, and um, thanks for that very generous introduction, both of you <laughs> and Lydia. Just, it's really, uh, I really appreciate you inviting me. Um, you're really the reason that uh, I'm teaching the class that Olivia was describing, uh, and my talk today really starts with with that. I was talking with an undergraduate environmental science policy major about seven or eight years ago. And I was just thoroughly impressed with her and, and the work that she was doing. And she was lamenting that the undergrad majors have to take one economics class and it just, just doesn't seem to fit. It doesn't talk about any of the things that you do in the rest of the major. And uh, and she was trying to be nice and not say that like she was against economics or anything. She knew I was an economist. And it hit me like a lightning bolt. Oh, the way economics curriculum is structured, the first semester is all about how great markets are. They do all these amazing things. If everyone behaves in their own self-interest and the market is perfectly competitive, it does all the, it allocates resources efficiently and it's good for the world. And it's not until you get to the second semester where you learn all about the ways that markets fail. Monopolists, 
restrict output and artificially raise the price. All the problems we study in the environment are versions of market failures often with externalities where the, the polluting firm doesn't bear the cost of the pollution that it generates. That goes on all the rest of us. And firms that are exploiting natural resources often don't have all of the right incentives to use them sustainably for the very long run. But you can't really get to the, that material in the econ sequence until the second semester. So I thought, oh, well, this is a solvable problem. What we'll do is we'll just create a new class where we can talk about the wondrous things that markets do on the one hand, which is the traditional entree in Econ 101, and all the ways that they fail and how that relates to the environmental problems and the natural resources sustainability issues that we're so passionate about dealing with. So today I want to talk about those two themes. And I think aquaculture, the farming of fish, is a nice illustration because it actually illustrates uh, both of these things. Aquaculture and the growth of, of fish farming globally, and we're going to talk a lot about salmon in particular, illustrates the wondrous things that markets do on the one hand, but at the same time has all kinds of environmental challenges associated with it and, and the ways that markets are, are failing. Okay, so our, our outline for today is going to be to kind of go through a little bit of how just how it is that markets do wonders. We'll talk about global seafood prices remaining low despite rising demand and lots of bad news about unsustainable fisheries. Then we'll kind of zoom in on, on healthy salmon products that are widely available at, at low prices and sort of celebrate that a little bit. Um, but then we'll talk about the problems with salmon aquaculture um, and the externalities that they generate, the, the instances where the firms that are, that are producing this product aren't really bearing the full costs to society. Um, but we'll also point out there are some positive externalities as well. And namely fish and seafood relative to other terrestrial uh, animal proteins is low in green, it is uh, not as greenhouse gas intensive. So um, that's that's really worth talking about a little bit more. And then we'll we'll get into what I think is the biggest challenge for aquaculture, which is managing disease. Okay, so um, Olivia knows how to draw one of these now. <laughs> Markets do one, so let's start with that. So many of you in, in um, marine sciences and, and interested in ocean conservation have probably seen a picture like this from um, the FAO, where we're looking at capture of seafood, to seafood production in aggregate. Starting in 1950, we see that it's sort of ramping up quite dramatically from 1970 until the mid-1980s, but then it basically levels off. There's, there's essentially no further growth. It kind of bounces around. And a lot of really good fishery scientists and some economists um, have, have debated about how much we could get, how much more we could get if we managed everything sustainably. And the answers sort of range from, you know, some people think maybe like 10% more, some people think as much as 20 or 30 percent more. You can imagine a world in which this plateau over here would shift up a little bit. But in the grand scheme of things, it would still plateau. There's only so much we can get out of the oceans from our capture fisheries. So we've seen this stagnant capture fisheries production. And all the while, human populations keep growing. There's more and more people on the planet. So you would think that that's going to actually significantly increase the demand for seafood. Not only have human populations been growing, but also countries are becoming wealthier. So China is becoming wealthier, India is becoming wealthier. So a lot of very highly populated countries are also getting um, richer. So all this seems like it would produce a lot of demand growth. So if we go back to that basic supply and demand curve, and we think about well, that supply of, of fish, it can't really go anywhere. It can't go up much. And you impose a dramatic increase in demand associated with rising incomes in middle income countries like China and India and Brazil and global population growth. It seems to me from the Econ 101 perspective that we should see 
prices skyrocket. You should see prices going way up because demand has shifted out and the supply can't really go anywhere. So the prediction is that prices are going to go up, right? But that's not what we see. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh my gosh, this is homework three. Uh, <laughs> it's not what we see. In fact, when you inflation adjust an index of global seafood prices, um, so you account for inflation, and then you graph the series in, in real terms so that you're comparing apples to apples across time, what you see is that, sure, the prices kind of bounce around a little bit, but they basically haven't changed. Like here's one, that's indexed at one, and they go down a little bit, they come back up a little bit, they go down a little bit, they come, come back up. They're kind of bouncing around one the whole time. So we've seen massive demand growth, a supply that's basically flat, so it's stagnant, you know, and um, prices haven't gone up. So what's wrong with our, our picture? Um, just here's another way to visualize it. So where I'm kind of putting these pieces of information together. So on the bottom here is the, that gray line is the price series that I just showed you. Um, the gray area is that capture seafood production that's bouncing around a little bit, but it's basically flat. The prices are flat, production is, isn't really changing. And then the black line, the solid black is actually combining um, uh, income per capita and population. So when you do real income per capita and population, it's going like crazy. And every time we've looked in the history of economics at what happens across societies when they become wealthier, they eat, people eat more animal protein. Every time we've ever looked in any context, we always find that. And every time you look across time within societies, maybe this is going to change, but in, the, in history, every time we look within societies across time, as societies become higher income, people eat more animal protein. So everything points to demand going up. Why hasn't price gone up? Why have global seafood prices remained stable despite rising demand? Well, you already know the answer because it's the, it's the title of my talk, or it's in the title. Right? The answer is aquaculture. The answer is, I only showed you the capture seafood production before. And when you put aquaculture, the farming of fish on top of it, and you can see that this trend has continued upward quite dramatically. So that red area there is farmed fish. And so when you go back over here, you see this, this line kind of has some kind of reflection of demand going up over time. You can kind of see by looking at that dramatic growth in aquaculture, just how it is that farming fish has kept pace in some sense with the rising demand. And that's the answer to the puzzle of why those seafood prices have remained low. And that's incredibly consequential because seafood is a healthy protein. Seafood is um, a necessary protein for a lot of low income people, in, especially in, in coastal developing nations. And over here on the right, we actually just see how that unfolded, how that growth in farm fish unfolded as an annual percent growth compared to every other food group. So just kind of take a look over here. This is our, sort of dividing up our entire food system globally into meat, milk, eggs, cereal, fruit, vegetables, and aquaculture. And each, this is decade by decade, the average annual percent growth you can see aquaculture in the dark blue is growing faster than every single food group, every single decade, from the 1970s all the way through to the 2000s. If you extend it, it, it the same is true for the 2010 um, to 2020 period. And early on, you'd say, well, aquaculture was tiny. You know, back in the early 70s, it was really small. So if you're talking about percent change, like, you're dividing by zero, so it's really or a small number. It's really easy to grow a high percent change when you're really small. But once you get out here into you know the 90s or the 2000s, this industry is actually quite large. And so now we're talking, it's still outpacing the growth of every other food sector. This is an amazing thing. When we go back to our supply and demand curve, it's true that demand has shifted out dramatically. But fish 
the seafood market is actually the combination of the wild caught fish and the farm fish. So when you put them together, you see a giant outward supply shift and that is actually kept prices low. So yeah, demand growth, but yeah, yeah, supply growth. So it naturally raises the question, you know, why exactly has aquaculture taken over? And there's a pretty simple explanation in economics. All the way, going back to the, the, the classical economists, uh, people like Adam Smith, you know, thinking about the invisible hand, thinking about uh, John Stuart Mill, Dave Ricardo, all these classical economists that you probably don't even read in economics classes anymore, but you might read them in like an intro, you know, philosophy class or something like that. Um, I mean, this is this is really channeling Adam Smith in many respects. Um, the, the leveling off of captured seafood is a scarcity, and it's more than that. It's a threat of scarcity. It's the idea that the prices could go skyrocket, and that creates opportunities. And those opportunities incentivize innovation in the aquaculture sector. So. It used to be that farming salmon was really expensive and farming a lot of other species of fish was really expensive. But we've seen massive technological innovation in response to this incentive to fill that market niche. And we've also seen market innovation. So development of new markets, new products. And it's a little bit of a question as to whether we've seen much policy innovation or whether we've seen enough policy innovation. So I'll return to that sort of at the end. Let's talk a little bit about technological innovation. And I'm just wanting to check to see if there's a way that I can keep track of time. So I don't want to. 18. Yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of periodically check on that. Okay. Oops. Okay, so let's talk about technological innovation. So it used to be that the cost of farming a kilogram of salmon. Um, in real 2013 inflation adjusted dollars, the cost was pretty close to $7 a kilogram back here in the mid 1980s. Um, I mean, if you walk into Whole Foods right now, you can, I mean, you could buy farmed salmon for less than $7 uh, a kilogram. It's pretty, it's, I mean, it's shocking. And that's with all the markup between you know, the cost that the firms incur when they produce it and getting it all the way into your whole foods in Durham. But essentially what's happened over time is that the cost has come down, 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 all the way down to something like $1.50, $2 in order to produce a kilogram of farm sand. It's a dramatic technological change. Um, and what happened? Not surprisingly, down, 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 down comes the price, right along with that. How could they do it? What did they actually do um, to innovate? The long story here is that farming fish is, it's kind of ancient and it's kind of new at the same time. Farming fish in a very deliberate way with selective breeding and farming salmon in particular I didn't even start at all until the 1960s. And so think about how many thousands of years humans have been selectively breeding livestock. <clears throat> and think about just the last 100 or so years, 150 years, where people have been using modern scientific methods to improve livestock production via breeding, via feed, via other sort of animal husbandry and so forth. And that only started with salmon in the 1960s. So there was a lot of low hanging fruit and that accounts for this dramatic change over time. Um, some of you might also wonder when you're looking at this, how is it that we could actually look at the cost? If you were economists, you would, you would be asking me that right now. And the answer to that is that proprietary information in this country is very, very hard to get if you're a researcher. But in Norway, they have different views on that. <laughs> and so my colleagues who did this study were able to um, access company records to, to figure out exactly how much it costs to farm a kilogram of salmon. So one of the big parts of that story in terms of the innovation 
is they figured out how to reduce the use of their most expensive ingredients. And this is good news for us who care about the sustainability of this industry because the most expensive ingredient for them was the feed. And the biggest component of the feed was fish meal. Fish meal from other fish, grinding up edible fish, mostly small, small pelagics like anchovies, sardines, and pilchard, and so forth. Grinding up small fish, turning it into fish meal, and feeding it to salmon. And way back in 1990, it took 4.4 kilograms of fish meal to make one kilogram of salmon. Well, that doesn't sound very sustainable, does it? I don't know. It's even worse if you look at fish oil because they need to use a lot of fish oil at the early life stages. 7.2 kilograms of fish equivalents of fish oil to produce one kilogram of salmon. Pretty dramatic. Not very sustainable, but also extremely expensive. So they figured out how to substitute in more vegetable ingredients and get these fish in, fish out ratios down dramatically, down all the way by 2013 to one kilogram uh, of fish meal to produce one kilogram of sand, one to one. Starting to sound a little bit more sustainable. Starting to sound a little bit more like you're kind of trading some anchovies that people don't really want to eat for some salmon that people really do want to eat. Um, there are some nuances associated with these different measures that we won't we won't get into. So that's a big part of the story. Part of it's substituting vegetable ingredients for the marine ingredient, the ex most expensive marine ingredient. But another part of the story is figuring out how not to waste. So a lot of feed that goes into salmon production um, in the early days just kind of pass right through the water column, sink to the bottom, be wasted. But it's worse than that, because what happens when you pile up a lot of feed at the bottom of a salmon net pen out in the fjord, you're going to get anaerobic decomposition down there. You're going to get low dissolved oxygen. You basically create your own little dead zone, your own little mini uh, uh, nutrient pollution problem at the bottom of your net pen. So in solving their feed problem, which was their most expensive ingredient, they also figured out a way to reduce their pollution to the surrounding environment. Um, and how they did that in part was by figuring out how to better suspend the feed in the water column um, so that it didn't float down too fast. But another way that they did it was to figure out how to know when the fish were done. Like, you know, if you could all watch us like kind of slowing down when we're kind of on that second or that third helping, you know, and you'd be like, okay, let's not burn them anymore. Just like that. Um, I just grabbed these pictures today because um, I didn't have any good pictures of this stuff. And uh, I found uh, Scale AQ, this company that sells um, technology to the salmon farming industry. And it's pretty wild. So they've got... They've got these feed, uh, sorry, that should say feed spreader, feed spreader uh, that sort of shoots the feed around and sort of distributes it so that the fish kind of, you know, they can get to it easily and you kind of distribute it around. They've got sensors checking on water quality, oxygenation of the water, things like that. And then they've got these crazy control rooms. I'm sorry, it's like Star Trek over there. But I mean, if you look closely, you can actually see they've got these images inside the net pen. Those are salmon swimming around and they're checking on this and they've got, you know, various things that they're monitoring. So it's kind of, it's become this very high-tech industry and that's part of the story for why they've been able to bring these costs down. It's also part of the reason that some people don't like the industry as much because they think, oh, it's very capital intensive. It doesn't employ very many people. But you can bet that those people have really good jobs. So there's a trade-off. Um, just briefly, <clears throat> the particulars are different, but the basic story is the same for shark. You've seen a giant expansion of aquaculture. So, so this is the quantity of global shrimp production. And you see, like, basically, starting in the 90s, this thing has just taken off as a result of farming shrimp globally. Um, and you can see the, pri the real price of shrimp tumbling down, down, down as the cost of farming shrimp became lower. Now, some of that in the case of shrimp, and 
is artificially low cost because they're they're not just using, but kind of abusing the natural environment. When they clear mangroves to make shrimp ponds in Southeast Asia, those costs are not, those are costs to the whole global environment that are not being accounted for. So some of those costs are artificially low. And you could say some of the costs for salmon are artificially low, but maybe not quite as extreme. Okay, so let's talk briefly about market innovation. Um, market innovation is really where you're, you're creating new products, you're developing new markets, and that's a big part of the story. Um, over spring break, I um, visited my in-laws in Arkansas, and um, my mother-in-law said, Martin, you're cooking dinner on, on Saturday. I'm like, great. Because they all make some Indian food, and that's kind of how I usually roll, or some kind of interesting Mexican food, some maybe some kind of fusion thing. And she's, oh, by the way, the, the Little Rock cousins who maybe don't, you know, eat like you do or come in for dinner. Like, what do you do? <laughs> you make salmon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I mean, <clears throat> students who are here know that I'm vegetarian, except that I eat fish. So I'll tell the rest of you that. Um, so, you know, you're going to make a menu for people who, you may, may or may not like your kind of spicy international cuisine or that you're used to making, um, but you can plan a meal around salmon. And you go to the supermarket in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and know that there will be fresh farm salmon available any day of the year. So when I made this slide originally, I was talking about the middle of the country being Kansas, not our Kansas, but the point still applies. Any day of the year. Think about what a remarkable achievement 30 years ago, no way. This did not exist. 40 years ago, nobody ate fresh salmon of any sort in the United States, except in a few places on the Pacific coast or in very, very fancy restaurants in big city, white tablecloth restaurants. Now it's everywhere. You can get salmon in dozens of restaurants in virtually every city and you can get it fresh any day of the year. It's a remarkable achievement, and that's marketing. And that is market innovation, penetrating markets. But along with that market innovation, <laughs> down came the price of wild caught salmon as well, because the price is actually being driven now by the cost of producing farm salmon. So that's not great for people who fish for salmon for a living. But when I went to that store in Fayetteville, Arkansas to buy my salmon, that farm salmon, sitting right next to it was sockeye in the fresh fish case. And that wouldn't have been there 30 years ago. Either. So the salmon market has transformed so that the wild caught salmon is now being sold fresh right next to the farm salmon in places that it wasn't previously. So the, the, the market innovation in one has spilled into market innovation. I didn't buy the sockeye because it was previously frozen and looked a little, you know, so but the, the farm salmon looked really good and I got that and everybody was happy. Happy. We sent the we sent the little rock cousins home full. Okay, so what's happened in the US seafood market? Um the top species group in U.S. Uh, per capita consumption terms, um, shrimp, tuna, salmon, pollock, tilapia. Take a look at what's trending up and what's trending down. Shrimp trending up, <clears throat> salmon trending up, tilapia trending up. Pollock, mm, bouncing around, kind of flat. Tuna, kind of trending down. I always wonder why students don't love canned tuna anymore. <laughs> Why is that? The things that are trending up are the things that are farmed. So the, the farm farm fish is, is the reality of our seafood farm. Another thing that happens with market innovations is that new innovations build on the previous innovation. So in salmon farming, there was selective breeding, and that got them to the point where they could grow faster. Then they started innovating on the feed technology, the pens themselves, putting in fancy sensors, control rooms, et cetera. They started building more and more sophistication. 
Then came a company called Samara. Samara is a company that it's kind of a terrible name, right? <laughs> it's a Norwegian company. They don't really have a U.S. name yet. But they basically figured out, oh, if we chill the fish just right before we slaughter them, we can take the highest quality filet without any of the pin bones, vacuum pack it, and get it into supermarkets as sashimi salmon the next day. Now, if you've ever had salmon that was in the water the day before and then eaten as, as sashimi, as sashimi, I can tell you it's spectacular. And of course, you wouldn't do that with Pacific salmon because Pacific salmon has parasites, but farmed Atlantic salmon doesn't. So you can eat it raw right out of the vacuum pack the day after it was in the water. It's spectacular. But Salma Raw didn't stop there. They said, well, people love this product. So what will we do? We're going to package it up, slice it a little bit, put it in a snack pack with Ponzi sauce and sesame seeds, and sell it in 7-Eleven. I paid $8 for that snack in 7-Eleven in Bergen. And let me just remind you, Norway is a really expensive country. Bergen's a really expensive city. And that only cost me $8, like, it was probably like seven or eight years ago. $8 for the best snack I've ever had in my life. <laughs> That's market innovation. Couldn't have been possible without the other stuff. All right, but markets can fail too. So what I want to point out here is that we actually, we really need policy, we need policy innovation in order for aquaculture to realize its full potential going forward. It's realized a lot of potential to this point. It's had a lot of environmental problems, some of which have gotten better. It's had, it has some environmental problems that persist. And if we're gonna grow this industry significantly, we need better policies. So um, Olivia will recognize this picture too. <laughs> some version of that might be on the midterm. Um, okay, so for those of you who haven't taken my class, an externality is just the cost or a benefit that affects a party who did not choose to incur that cost or benefit. So if a salmon farm has escapes from the farm, um, that's a loss to the salmon farmer. But those escapes, if they go out and they inbreed with wild populations and mess up the ecosystem, that's a cost to society at large. And the salmon farmer is paying a small cost from their, their fish that, that swam away, but they're not paying that larger cost to society of damage to the ecosystem. So the list of potential externalities in salmon aquaculture are escapes because of the ecosystem da uh, damage and genetic contamination. The water pollution, we already sort of talked about that eutrophication problem that's gotten a little bit better because of the feed problem, but also pumping them filled with, you know, full of antibiotics and sending those out into the environment. Um, the fish meal trap is just another way of referring to that problem of how much fish do you need to grind up in order to grow a kilogram of fish. So that's a problem that has also gotten better for the salmon industry. It hasn't gone away completely. It's not like they're fish in, fish out ratios, you know, straight away down to like half or something like that. But the big one for me is disease and, and pathogen spillovers. Those are problems that the industry has an incentive to deal with, but their incentives are, aren't great enough to deal with the global challenge of feeding more people more animal protein, if that's what we're going to end up doing, um, and, and not having major declines. Um, that I'll show you some examples of in a second. But lest we forget, there is this one really big positive externality, and it's also associated, I think, with a public health externality as well, a positive public health externality. And that's a substitution away from more greenhouse gas intensive proteins that in many cases are also substantially less healthy. So we'll talk about that a little bit. All right, so the escapes problem. Um, we don't have good data on this for um, the second largest salmon producer in the world, which is Chile. Um, so I can't show you a picture of that, and I don't know to what extent it's gotten better over time. But in, in Norway, we have quite a lot of evidence to suggest escapes have gotten a lot better. So 
Back in the 90s, there were a lot of escapes. These, these white bars here are the total number of escapes. And then you get smaller and smaller numbers over time. And so that in and of itself suggests the problem is getting a little bit better. But when you consider that, that this black line is actually the production, and this, these bars are the total escapes, the actual escape per unit of production is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's got kind of infinitesimally small. And the basic story for antibiotics is, is, based, is the same. So in the early days, back in the 80s, uh, into the early 90s, there was a lot of antibiotic usage in total. Now there's very, very little, and the production, of course, has gone way, way up. But it doesn't mean that the industry gets a total pass on this. But these are externalities that may have been of great concern back in the 90s or the 80s uh, that are maybe a minor concern now. And um, I, I told this story. <laughs> I told this story when I was talking to the um, Duke uh, Conservation Society. <laughs> you were <laughs> so Andy's going to have to hear this story again. Um, but I had uh, I had occasion to host my um, my collaborator Frank Asha from Norway on a Fulbright, um, and he was here for the year. And then three of his collaborators, who also work on salmon aquaculture, came to town and. Uh, we all like were working together on a paper, and then we went to lunch over at uh, the Great Hall, now called the Broadhead Center, but before they had remodeled. And uh, we get our lunches and we sit down at the table. And so there's like four Norwegians who work on salmon aquaculture and me. And we sit down at the table, and every table has a little cardboard table tent sign that says, say no to farm salmon. Every single one. And these guys looked at me like, how, how do you have the time to play such an elaborate practical joke on us? <laughs> no, it's a student group that wants to say no to farm salmon. And, and of course it probably was the Duke Conservation Society. Who knows what it was? Um, and it's not that those weren't real concerns uh, about the problems with that industry. It's that, the concerns were sort of lagging a little bit behind what was actually going on. So like, if you were like worried about antibiotics, um, you know, sometime in 2010, really that was a worry that, that started to go away back in the early nineties. Not gone away completely, but that's part of what was driving. The same thing with the fish meal problem. Um, I'll sort of skip over this and just to say, we've already, you know, we've done some statistical testing to show that even though there's only so much supply of fish meal and fish oil in the world, um, that limited supply has not limited the growth of aquaculture. Okay, so the one that I think is a real, real big problem is disease. And that's the one where industry has strong incentives to do something, but not strong enough incentives to do as much as they need to do. So we need more policy. This is a little schematic of what's happened in shrimp. Um, shrimp is a little bit depressing, uh, but I'll just kind of highlight a few things here. Um, in the 1990s, um, losses from the top five viral diseases were in the range of $1.5 billion per year. It's not income. And then I'll point to this more recent outbreak of EMS, that's early mortality syndrome. Um, Thailand is the largest shrimp producing country in the world. So the largest one, Thai output fell 47% between 2013 and 2014. I'm sorry, 47%. Okay. I mean, that's a, that is a giant supply disruption. You can see what that looks like with um, imports into the United States um, from Thailand. So here's EMS from and Thailand. Imports drop right off the table. Um, you saw like Ecuador didn't have problems with EMS, and so their their imports increased, and U.S. imports from other countries increased some. The prices actually did go up, and wild trip, uh, trippers in the Gulf of Mexico benefited some. But um, over here is infectious salmon anemia. This is an outbreak of a, a virus um, that's hit multiple places around the world, but it hit very hard in Chile. Around 2007, and you can see this is Chile's um, tonnage of salmon 
grew really dramatically in the 90s, sort of leveled off, and then infectious salmon in the media hits, drops off the table. Um, if you didn't have infectious salmon anemia in your fish, if you were a Norwegian producer, for instance, that year, you made a killing because the prices went, went up very substantially. Because this is the second largest salmon producer that year. Uh, Chile has since recovered. You can still buy Costco salmon from Chile. Um, it was a pretty dramatic change. One of the big problems that has not gone away that, that the Norwegian industry, the Chilean industry, all, all every salmon industry around the world has struggled with sea lice. They look very attractive down there. The sea lice kind of suck it on the fish. They're, they're technically not lice. They're, uh, they're crustaceans that are parasitic. Um, and so uh, they kind of, from the firm's point of view, uh, this, is a, this is a disease problem that requires um, some attention because they stress the fish and they cause the fish to grow more slowly. And that means less profit. So the, the individual firms want to do something about this. The problem is it's like any other CAFO. You're, you're concentrating disease in, in a small area, in these net pens. And so you get these big outbreaks and then they can spill over into the, the surrounding farms. So you might have some incentives to control your lice problem within so a range for yourself, but you have no incentive to deal with the fact that your lice are gonna spill over and contaminate your neighbors. And moreover, you don't have any incentive to care about the wild salmon that are also swimming in the same fjords and, and swimming up river to breed and the other um, fish in the ecosystem that are gonna be potentially harmed by these big aggregations of sea lice. So what, we've, what we found in empirical work um, looking at one of the technologies that's used to manage sea lice, uh, which are cleaner fish, they're basically uh, small uh, fish like sea rats that are, they have a mutualistic relationship with the salmon. They, they literally eat the sea lice off of the salmon. Um, so it's a nice kind of exploitation of this um, ecological relationship as a, as a treatment for the sea lice problem. What we found is that the price of the sea wrasse, the, the cleaner fish that are eating up the sea lice, is actually reflective of the implicit value to the firms that are using them to treat them. So the, the market price is actually the private marginal cost, um, or the private marginal value of treating with the cleaner fish. The problem is that that price isn't fully reflective of uh, the benefit to society. So that price should be even lower because the benefit to society would mean preventing spillovers to the surrounding farms and preventing damage to the ecosystem. So it come to a point from a private firm optimization point of view, but they have to come all the um, way. Let's talk about positive externalities. Uh, public health is a big one. Fish are healthy. Seafood is very healthy. Um, Maybe if you're going to eat a vegan diet, um, you know, you can make, there are certain ways that you could be extremely healthy, but in the, in the spectrum of you're going to eat some animal products, um, seafood is really almost always going to be the winner. There's a few exceptions here and there. But salmon is bizarrely healthy in terms of its um, omega-3 content uh, and for the price. So Farmed salmon is basically the cheapest fresh fish you can you can buy that could reduce your coronary your risk of coronary death by 36%. 50 cents a week to reduce your risk of coronary death by 36%. It's, it's staggering. Now, of course, this is an average number, averaged across the whole population and everything. And so there are many caveats associated with this. Um, that's a pretty substantial public health. I mean, heart disease is still, you know, right up there. Number one killer in the United States and many other countries in the world. And so this message is sort of repeated in, in a slightly different context. Um, the Eat Lancet report is really about putting um, health benefits of diet together with sustainability. So dietary change kind of envisioned as a way to address these two pressing problems of our time. One is that we have like all kinds of public health problems associated with 
diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and so forth. Um, we also have undernourishment in some parts of the world and within our society as well. Um, so that's the public health problem, nutrition problem on the one hand, and the sustainability problem on the other. So Eat Lancet reaches the conclusion that one of the things we should be doing is to go easy on meat consumption. While meat is an important source of key nutrients, including protein, iron, and vitamin B12, excess meat consumption can harm our health and the planet. Aim to consume no more than 40, uh, 98 grams of red meat, 203 grams of poultry, and 196 grams of fish per week. So, average U.S. beef consumption coming in at four, uh, 295.4 grams per week, more than three times what Eat Lancet is recommending. Average seafood consumption, on the other hand, coming in at 179 grams per week. That's actually less than the upper limit of Eat Lancet. And you can sort of imagine if we're going to actually get this beef number down, um, some of that is going to go into more vegetable proteins and things, but some of it's also going to have to go into seafood. We're not going to turn everyone into vegans as virtuous as the vegan part. As I'm looking into it. <laughs> so. And so, you know, uh, greenhouse gas is, uh, the, the greenhouse gas implications of this also are a positive externality for seafood. Um, so we did some calculations in, in our paper um, in uh, 2022 based on this really comprehensive life cycle assessment of food um, in, in science from 2018. And we, we sort of imagine like if you were to put in a carbon tax of $100 a ton, how much would that add to prices of, of different um, animal products? And you'd see that that would add six dollars, um, six dollars a pound to beef, four dollars a pound to lamb, about thirty a pound to pork, um, ninety cents a pound to poultry, and seventy cents a pound farm fish. So just from those numbers, you can see just what a dramatic difference in terms of the green, the embodied greenhouse gases farm fish have compared to these other sources. Now this is kind of farm fish in average. So you wouldn't want to take this number and compare it directly to salmon. Salmon's probably coming in somewhere around poultry or maybe somewhere between pork and poultry. But nonetheless, it's sort of down towards the bottom. Okay, so I think we've kind of come to the end here. Um, and I want to leave plenty of room for questions. And uh, thank you all for coming out and listening. And uh, you know, think more about aquaculture and it might be an important part of our future. Yeah. Uh, one of the parts you showed it was, I think, one gram of fish meal for every gram of salmon. And to me, that, I don't know, it doesn't really make any sense because in bio, we're always like, oh, you go up the COVID level, you're losing some of that. Energy is heat, so how are they able to get an equal return on their from the feet? Yeah, from the feet. Yeah. Well, because the um, the technology, like that's a that's a that's an ecosystem reality. We're talking about like selective breeding combined with really you know incredibly sophisticated engineering and feed and the and the system for feeding them. And so in the wild, they don't have the option of eating um, some marine ingredients and, and like kind of like munching on some soy protein also. So, so but they, they can do just fine if you breathe them that way. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people think, oh, that's unnatural in some sense, but, you know, kind of everything in, in, in a lot of sense, you know, everything about our food system is a little bit unnatural. So that's that's kind of the way that, that it ends up working. It's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, because it, it, it sort of, they're so expensive that it, it makes it very hard to see, like that it, the price would be like up here and then all this would just kind of look like you couldn't see the trends very well. So why are they expensive? Oh, why is Chinook expensive? 
Yeah. Because uh, it's awesome. It's it's really good. Yeah. So I mean, when when chefs run taste tests, uh, like farm versus wild and stuff, they do blind taste tests. And, um, they, there've been some cases where Costco farm salmon has been out like wild caught coho and wild caught um, uh, sockeye. And, you know, people are real, or, or even like some of the kind of specialty farm salmon, you know, organic Scottish farm salmon. And um, it's not that the fit, you know, that, that there's something great about the farming per se, it's that Atlantic salmon are just a kind of a naturally a, like a fattier fish than those Pacific varieties. And that makes them, it makes them very forgiving when you cook. Um, and so Chinook is also a little bit like that as well. Chinook is a, a fattier fish and it's much more forgiving when you cook it. And so it's one of the reasons it's so incredibly delicious. Um, and, and whereas like, you, you can mess up coho so easily, like you can turn it into just a hockey puck like that. It's, um, so that's part of it, right? I mean, it's part of the reason that this market has, has changed the way it has because most people are not like, you know, top chefs and cooking seafood is not necessarily easy, but cooking farm salmon actually is. Yeah. Um, is the majority of that growth in aquaculture, is that a result of an increase in the size or the quantity of the Oh, great question. Um, so it's both. And, and um, if you look at sort of global aquaculture in aggregate, both of those things have happened. You've seen this, like in economics, we say growth at the intensive and the extensive margin. So you, you see this, this proliferation. In salmon in particular, what you've seen is um, at the beginning, growth of many, many firms. And then subsequently, you've seen a lot of consolidation. So now there are fewer salmon firms than there used to be. Um, and none of them really have are big enough to have real market power and like control the price, but they're, they're, you know, maybe kind of on the, on the cusp of that. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's part of it. Whereas in shrimp, it's just, it's just the opposite. It's really all just growth at the extensive margin. So many, many, many firms and the consolidation in that industry is more in the exporting and the processing and, and, um, and that side. But you have lots and lots of small shrimp farms that are then selling into these like sort of you know selling the internet. Does that like affect the kinds of like policy regulations that are put on other Yeah, I mean this is a great question. I mean in in environmental economics, we always you know point to non-point source pollution is much harder to deal with than point source pollution. If you have like a few power plants that are you know exactly where they're located, it's it's a lot easier to regulate those than it is to regulate tailpipe emissions of everyone's car in the whole country or something. Just as a, you know, kind of as a juxtaposition. So yeah, so when you have a like a very small number of firms, um, it's a little easier to regulate than in principle. In practice, the small number of firms also are more able to have political power and influence the regulatory process. That can be a bad thing. It might be a good thing because they might actually be able to work together to find regulations that are effective but not too costly, but you could also be cynical about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my my colleague Frank Asha is, you know, a lot of the work that is in this is, is work that we've done together. Um, he really laments you know, how poorly performing U.S. aquaculture is. And, and we, we debate about to what extent, um, you know, what, what's the real cause of that. But um, in, in the paper that we recently wrote together, uh, we argue basically that, that in much of the world, you have a commons problem where um, places like mangroves are just, it's a, it's a commons, it's a free-for-all, and people can go and set up they're shrimp ponds, and there's too little restriction on growing on on just kind of haphazardly growing that industry. 
In the US, we have exactly the opposite problem. We have an anti-commons problem where if you want to set up an aquaculture operation, you have to deal with EPA jurisdiction, NOAA jurisdiction, state regulators, local, um, local government, FDA, possibly USDA, because USDA and NOAA are going to be battling over who controls the, you know, farming fish in, in sort of brackish water and, and, you know, where does the regulatory line get drawn in the sand. And so you have all these overlapping um, jurisdictions that create basically an anti commons problem. You're sort of over excluded and it's very, very hard. Um, there are some really smart people at, at NOAA, at National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, who are trying to fix this. And in my little way, I've been trying to get the economists of these agencies to talk to each other. So I was, had, I was talking to the head of the Economic Research Service at USDA at the Agricultural Economics meetings last summer. And then I was talking at the fisheries, the North American Fisheries Economics meeting to the chief economist at, the, at, at NOAA Fisheries. And I was trying to explain to both of them that they need to get together on this. They need to acknowledge that NOAA is, has to be a food agency and solve this problem. And they kind of know it, but there's all kinds of you know, political weirdness. So it doesn't really answer your question. I, I think there's some reason for, for optimism, but maybe not a ton. Yeah. For your, the antibiotics graph, you know, mm -hmm. when there was such high UTs of antibiotics that that selected for, any antibiotic resistance in different diseases, and then no, yeah. also like what changed in uh, the early 2000s that the antibiotic use fell off the cliff. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So, um, so one thing that changed is um, vaccination. So they figured out that they could vaccinate for certain species diseases. Um, another thing that changed is that um, they were they were. I think started to become concerned about antibiotic resistance and, and issues like, you know, we can't just dump, we can't just dump cheap antibiotics into the ecosystem and, and just assume it's all going to work itself out. Uh, and that was sort of like a really, you can think of it as like this really blunt thing, um, kind of like my crappy childhood doctor who would just prescribe antibiotics every time you had the sniffles, just figuring, well, you know, maybe that will be the thing. Um, you know, doctors don't do that as much anymore, but I mean, I can tell you in the mid 1970s, they still did. And, um, and so, you know, yeah, the mid 19s, my, my family doctor in the mid 70s, the salmon industry in the mid 80s, more or less the same. <laughs> Um, obviously, the context of this talk was more salmon, which is not a good thing for farming. But where do you see like grass facilities putting the play here, either in the US or other different species? How does that play it? Yeah, so it's funny that you 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 presume that salmon is not going to be a uh, kind of land based, tank based, um, closed cycle because, or, because they're doing some of that now with salmon. Um, and a lot of people think it's crazy. Because like it just seems like, you know, why would you like you you have to do so much to kind of artificially create this marine environment on land, um, but the the farm that's in Florida, um, if it reaches its full potential in terms of its grow out, will be the largest sand facility in the world. Uh, that's a big yeah. Um, so, um, but what other species? Right. I mean, I think. It's getting a little beyond like my my expertise to conjecture too much. Um, I do know that my my colleagues who are a little more you know have a heavier foot in aquaculture than I do um, feel like the catfish industry is, has not innovated as much as as it could. That it's been complacent with kind of early innovation, and then the rest of the world has caught up and blown by it. And so what you've seen is like there was a time when catfish was um, within a certain market segment, U.S. catfish was, was the thing. But now it's competing with tilapia and it's competing with pangosius, which the catfish industry has succeeded in getting them to not call it Vietnamese catfish um, when they import it. But nonetheless, people are eating it and it's directly competing with them. And restaurants like to buy it um, because it, you know, it can kind of slot into certain dishes a little bit better than, than catfish can. So, uh, I think it's a question of, of 
whether the U.S. industries are going to be able to uh, to innovate at the level of innovation that we've seen in other parts of the world. Which you know, it seems weird to say the U.S. is really not being innovative. But it, it's true; it's not hasn't been in the sector. Yeah. Oh, so. go ahead, and then I'll probably. Yeah. That's what they claim, right? I mean, this is like, you know, it's funny um, as a as a, an academic who you know meets the people from these companies periodically at, at things where they bring scholars and industry people together. You know, they send these like really slick marketing people. They tell these great stories about what they're going to be able to do, and it sounds very persuasive, but. Um, it hasn't really happened with that the Florida fund. We've had a lot of struggles um, and some, you know, and some die-offs and things like that. So, um, but yeah, like if if it if it works the way they're planning, it it will be um, more cost-effective in certain ways. And I think one of the reasons for that is that um, they can control the environment more. I mean, net pens are net pens are kind of. Um, you know, it's still out there in the wild. And like the, there's weather, there's all kinds of stuff happening. Um, there's also seasonal changes in the temperature. And stuff. So once you're in an environment where you're controlling that stuff, then you can actually in, enhance the growing. Season. And so you can breed for fish that are, that are actually growing year round, whereas salmon kind of mostly only grow in the warmer periods. And so so in theory, these, I mean, the, the, the slick marketing people are making claims that could turn out to be true. In practice, they haven't exactly so far. You, you had a question up front here, and we're running low on time. Please go ahead. And then uh, I was wondering, is, um, are there a lot of self-regulating markets aside from like federal agencies involved with the school? At least yeah. in the United States. Yeah, so there's like Global Aquaculture Alliance, and, and there's some you know attempts at, at sort of private Third party governance and, and private sector governance to um, assert some control, especially because so much of, of fish farming in aggregate is taking place in parts of the world that have less state capacity for regulation. So they might have good laws and stuff on the books, but maybe not the, the financial resources to enforce them. So that sort of triggered a lot of interest in. in um, using sort of certification schemes and, and eco-labeling and things like that to try to ensure um, some semblance of, of sustainability. And um, I think the same will, you know, those those same entities will apply if U.S. aquaculture takes off more. But, um, it's you know, in some sense, I, I don't, there, there hasn't been a lot of consumer um, embracing the boss. And a lot of people who are already very kind of green, you know, minded sort of been, have embraced those things, but broadly they haven't had all that much impact. Um, it's, you know, they haven't generated sufficient premiums to really strongly incentivize different practices. You know, obviously. Yeah, a couple of uh, questions yes. from the Marine Lab. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah I, I'm sorry if I forgot about you. Marine lab. No, it's okay. I've got them. Um, got but it. one of the questions they had is often when taxes are introduced to counter environmental externalities, people oppose based upon food insecurity yeah. arguments. Do you have any insight into how to persuade people that such policies are worthwhile, even if they make the food more expensive in the short run? Yeah. Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, we talk about this a lot. <laughs> my class and the sort of fundamental regressivity of something like a carbon tax because a carbon tax will hit very hard on your energy transportation and the food and those three things are a very large share of the budget of someone who's low income and a much smaller share of their but of the budget for somebody who's high income so um if we're talking about taxes um at, you know if we're talking about something like a carbon tax um, the, the straightforward, obvious solution to this is to tie it to a revenue redistribution um, that allows people to have low, you know, to lower their income taxes associated with the, the carbon tax revenue that's been created. And you can, 
design that from the outset to be extremely progressive so that the rebating happens at the at the lower end of the income tax brackets uh, or disproportionate uh, that. Or you could rebate flat sum amounts where the flat sum amount to a higher income person is going to be not very very meaningful to them, but it's going to be a substantial chunk of money to a lower income person. And it's going to pivot somewhere in the middle of the income distribution. So in theory, you could actually you know, marginally decrease inequality by having a carbon tax designed in like that. In practice, it's going to, you know, it's be very hard to achieve that. Okay, so I'm wondering, mm -hmm. last yeah. question from, do you believe that the transition from commercial fishing to aquaculture in mass is necessary to combat overfishing? And if so, how can you facilitate this shift in places like Tartar County? Ah, yeah. Okay, so um, first of all, like the link between um, the seafood market and overfishing is really predicated on how you are or you're not managing the fisheries. So a well-managed fishery um, that has skyrocketing prices is not a problem. It's not going to undo the good management. It's just going to create more profits for the, the people who fish for a living. But a poorly managed fishery um, is, is one that, you know, in, in the kind of purest open access sense where there's no management is one where the higher the price goes, um, the worse off the fishery will be. So if you kind of think of these two polar opposites, one is really well managed, where higher prices translate into just continued sustainability and more profits, versus one is unmanaged, where higher prices just put you in a spiral that further degrade the stock. So I think fisheries in Carteret County, like there's probably some spectrum. Some of them are a little bit more toward one end of that spectrum and others are a little more toward the other end of the spectrum. I was really struck when I worked on blue crab um, about 15 years ago um, that in blue crab, they started to experiment with a, a, a pilot sort of rights-based system where they would have some kind of um, uh, pot limit um, for, for blue crab. And um, in a very short amount of time, one or two years, they immediately abandoned it and, and sort of put in the management plan. We will only consider open access alternatives going forward. It's kind of like, to me as an economist, it's sort of like saying, we will absolutely insist that this fishery will not be sustainable. <laughs> It, thou shalt not be sustainable. <laughs> it, it, just, it felt like that. And of course, it's, it's not exactly what was intended by that language, but it really, that language, um, I think, you know, illustrates that problem. So sort of circling back to the idea with aquaculture, if you keep prices down, you will alleviate some pressure on those fisheries that are really unmanaged or poorly managed. So that, that is a real thing. Um, and, the right, and the right way to think about that isn't necessarily that aquaculture is lowering prices it's more that it's keeping prices from from going up and so it's kind of like it's keeping a bad situation from getting worse um but for those people who are fishing for a living and and working hard to fish sustainably and cooperating with management to achieve a sustainable outcome competition from aquaculture just just lowers your profits so um it's, so it's those two things, right? I mean, I think that this is a fabulous question because there's so much richness in all of that. The short question is that why Pacific salmon farmers they farm salmon? Is that they're arguing they're well managed and this is just killing the market? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the, there's no question that, uh, you know, if you're in the if you're if you're a wild if you're in the capture salmon industry um back in this period when these prices are coming down like crazy because of competition with farm salmon i mean this was catastrophic um what's happened since then is that their prices have started to come back up a little bit because they've they've been able to sort of piggyback on that market innovation and find new new markets for their products and that's been actually quite good for them so you know, on net now, I think it's it's sort of pushing in both directions. Um, probably most most fishermen, you know, in, in that industry might not say 
they want, might not admit that like, oh, the farm salmon industry is kind of helping us a little bit. Um, but for sure, back in this period, it was not. It was hurting a lot. Thank you all. Don't thank tell. you guys all for coming, and thank you so much for uh, you. speaking with us. This is fabulous. Oh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks all for coming out. Really, I mean, the question is so good. So, yeah, great job. Glad you showed me. Uh, so.